Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, please sit like this. Take a rest and enjoy. Let's talk about some very, very simple and small containers that will help to run your Java applications. Well, I'm uh, Dr. Who today. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I really only saw this kind of fez uh, hats a few days ago, but still, why not? Uh, I work at a company named Bellsoft. That's why I'm talking about containers to you. We produce containers with our, with our own JDK distribution. It's called Liberica JDK. Uh, maybe some of you know that there are build packs that assemble your Spring Boot applications. And uh, Liberica JDK and Liberica Native Image Kit power uh, that build packs by default. So you may use uh, our JDK and even don't know that you already do this. So uh, we're not just some company. We actively contribute to Open JDK. And one of contributions that we made is uh, the port of Open JDK to that. Uh, smallest currently and uh, fully functional Linux uh, that I'm going to talk you about. Why are we talking about containers at all? Well, because maybe some of you attended previous talk, they are very convenient. So it's a mature thing from the perspective of usability. It's very handy to take all the things, all the components of your systems, as the containers and assemble them with some intelligent container orchestration system like Kubernetes. And you work with black boxes, with bricks, uh, bricks uh, build your production system, and it's much easier, much more convenient. It was a long way, but now we have good tooling around that. So let's think about uh, a container image and a container. So what you get, then you want to start an instance, a container. You're getting a container image from somewhere. It's a, it's a binary. You can share your favorite container image with a friend on a flashcard, or you can send it via email. It's possible. It's just an archive. So we, there is some a descriptor. There's some you know, file system specially designed to reflect what we do in containers, to reflect the layered structure. But in the end, it's just an archive. So you can share it, and you can deploy your production using just that archive. Put that on an FTP server, right? If someone still remembers, what is it? Uh, share it some other way. It's possible. You need a container management system. You need that image. So if you have them, you can run your container. So that's the most simple case, but nobody does that really. right? So we all use clouds, uh, and we use container registers. Well, how does it work? We collect all necessary layers, parts of our resulting container somewhere in some registry uh, that's, uh, that can be connected to a container management system that pulls our images from that registry or updates them. That's much, much more convenient than working with an archive, right? So uh, the registry, uh, it may be different. You may have a different vendor. It can be located locally at your environment, or it can be provided to you as a service. All these variants exist, right? So you can take. Uh, for example, uh, Amazon Container Registry or Google Container Registry, right? They are replaceable. Then you make an actual deployment, and you pull the image. You have a via transfer. You transfer that archive or a part, like a layer, over the network. So that uh, has an influence to your billings. And it may 
be fast or it may be slow, depending on which uh, network boundaries do you cross. And uh, also, who managed that registry? What's the quality of service provided for it? So for example, it can be uh, located you know, in development environment. Yes, it's still possible. If you have uh, a network access to it, you can deploy it to some system. It can be a third party registry, like Docker Hub, for example. Right? You just push your, uh, your uh, images to that registry and then pull them in production or testing systems. Uh, you can also have a mirror registry that helps you uh, to be kind of independent or make additional checks or reduce the traffic than you work the third party or any other uh, external registry. Right? That's probably the most typical picture. Uh, the other typical picture is everything provided by your service provider, like Amazon. Right? Everything is inside, and you just use ready-made solutions for typical problems. Right? It's that easy. But, oh, yes, uh, you, you can also use trusted registry. Sometimes uh, it is critical uh, to know what is the exact source of your containers. Uh, maybe it has the restrictions on uh, its location, on its physical location. So again, you have a trusted registry, and you have internal registry uh, inside your production, uh, which is connected to your actual container management system. So we know that there is no free lunch. Things that used to be free become getting uh, paid features. Like if you have too many uh, requests, pull requests uh, on uh, Docker Hub, you've faced the limit there, and you have uh, to pay for the service. You can also face some costs uh, if you cross uh, network bounds, like region bounds, even inside the same service provider, like Amazon. If you were unlucky and your container images were in one zone and you pulled them to another zone, that will cost you something. So it reflects the idea of container image being not something ephemeral, but a real archive transferred from one place to another. It is obviously a not free operation. Someone pays for the traffic, someone pays for unpacking uh, this archive, etc. And yes, uh, you spend time. That's your time and time on the machines that you own or uh, machines that you rent. That also costs something. Obviously, if we have smaller archive, it will help. What alternatives? Well, control everything. Control that you always pull uh, from the same network, or I don't know, you don't update your image at all or do it very frequently. And this is risky, right? Because we need to update our images. We need to update uh, JDKs. We need to update operating system layer. We need to update our application, right? So make it small. And small containers uh, doesn't mean that they are not fully functional. They're like TARDIS. Small outside, but very powerful inside. And what I care about is the part about uh, base images or parent images, images that contain operating system layer and uh, uh, JDK inside. So then. We prepare our, our application. Uh, there are some choices. We can uh, prepare kind of fat jar or a set of libraries and a thin jar. They may uh, give one or several layers in our container. And so we have uh, the application, the libraries. We may have additional operating system packages that help our application to work. Uh, or we can have native components uh, that invoke such uh, 
packages from operating system. Uh, that's more kind of things related to the application part, the tip of an iceberg. And below that, we have Java runtime. We have operating system layer. So in container, uh, that are just libraries. So we use, uh, if we talk about Linux, we use the host kernel, same kernel, but we have different libraries. We have different libraries, different tools. So operating system environment looks like not a host in a container. It uses host facilities, but it's not a host environment. And there are some very basic set of configs uh, that makes scratch image not empty, but these are close to nothing. So for a long time ago, maybe a year or so, uh, we had a questionnaire on a conference about how people create uh, their containers. Do they use it at all? Let's do a quick uh, exercise now. Who already uses containers and deploy the applications in containers? Oh, really? Less than a half? Okay. Uh, and who doesn't? <laughs> um, please tell me uh, other people who they are. <laughs> so what do you do? You don't know? Uh, are you using containers or not? Or let's do it again. Who's using containers? Oh, that's better. Who's not? OK. Yes, don't, don't be shamed. Don't be shame. That's fine. Because next question, next question. Uh, to those who use containers, uh, please raise your hand. Who had some, some tricky issue with running an application in a container, like performance issue or configuration issue or DNS issue, <laughs> and successfully resolved it? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking to you because uh, now your exercise is to come to me after the talk and to tell me about this story. I'm very, very interested about that because what we're trying to do is to help developers, all developers, to solve their issues. So uh, the question, again, to people who use containers and to people who doesn't use containers, who don't use containers. So if you faced an issue and wasn't able to solve it, or you heard about it if you don't use containers, and that stopped you from using containers, please raise your hands. Otherwise, what stops you, right? OK, then come to me too. I will tell you stories that first people tell me how to solve that, OK? So I think the situation here uh, about this questionnaire is about the same, right? Some people write uh, Docker files their own. Some use uh, automated systems like plugins for Maven or, I don't know, parts of uh, Spring plugins that assemble containers for you. That may be Jeep, that may be uh, Paketo build packs or whatever. Right? Every approach has its benefits. Because if you use something ready-made, well, it just works, and you get containers as an output. There are some issues. Uh, this is a topic of completely different talk, but there are some issues. If you write a Docker file by your hand, well, it takes some work, right? It's more complicated, but it has benefits. You can use more optimized solutions, more up-to-date things, or control everything, right? So no right answer there. Just uh, know your goals. As we remember, we are trying to make our images smaller. So how do we do that? Well, first, let's look at the application. Let's make the application part smaller, because microservices are not so micro nowadays. Hundreds of megabytes per service. I mean, in jar files. I remember small programs. I know what small program is, and this is not a small program, right? But we can make it smaller by splitting 
into parts, keeping microservices micro. Well, it's possible. We can also use smaller dependencies, smaller libraries, uh, or like native tools uh, that help our application. Again, splitting will make one part of application using the dependency and another part not using it. So the first one obviously will be small. And we can try to minimize the OS part, right? Again, use write OS, use write packages. Sometimes there are alternatives. One may be, I don't know, smaller, another more performant. Sometimes it is like this, but not always. But uh, how would, would we select uh, that operating system that's best for us? Well, we have to choose some criteria. criteria. No way. We can't just pick something which is smaller. Maybe smaller is not exactly what we want. We may want some exact things, like certain package manager or certain bug, bug fixes. Well, it happens sometimes. So we compare that operating systems or operating system images, looking at multiple characteristics. Its size, its performance, its completeness, correctness. Well, yes. And the preferable way to get it, if you get the image that contains already your operating system layer and working JDK. Right? That's our expectations. Sometimes one part is not working. And this is really sad. And it, it happens in the wild. So we have to test. You have to know your provider. Please don't take any random image, hoping that it works. It may not work, or at least some part of it. So for base size, we have some cool options, like using minimal VM or some other weird uh, variants. Not suitable for everyone, right? Because minimal VM is slow, so it's really minimal, but Please know what you're doing. We can think of having no OS layer at all. Well, is distro less uh, no OS or no distro? How do you think? Who thinks that distro less doesn't have a distro? That's great. Yes. Yes, the answer is here. Uh, it just doesn't have a package manager. And uh, it's still bigger than some uh, other images that has it. So let's check. Let's take uh, the most common uh, image, right? Did I? OK. Uh, we'll explore one particular image. I don't know the, the exact version that uh, was used here. So typically, developers say, OK, we need open JDK. Let's take an open JDK from Docker, uh, exactly from Docker Hub. And whoever checked what's written on the page of this image on a Docker Hub, yes, just a few of us. And what's written there is that if you're looking for a JDK image for your production, that's probably not the right place, not the right place. <laughs> so we take a production image from a place where it's officially stated that that's not a thing for production. Why? Well, for example, because uh, there are no updates for uh, JDK 17. Only currently there are 1707, 1701, and 1702, but no 1703 that contains important security fixes. Elliptic curves fix, well, not there. But people still continue to use that. Not blaming, this is just a reference implementation image maintained by kind of uh, Docker Hub team. No problem, just please find out what happens. And if we look at its size, we can ex inspect layers and we can find what's inside. The compressed size of the image and uncompressed size, the actual size on disk that you spent 
and you pull this image to your local machine or to your production, to your actual pod. So if you look at the uncompressed size, it's like this. Some versions are bigger one, uh, than 500 megabytes. Some versions are smaller. But it's enormously large. What's inside? I only need JDK. Work in JDK, work in basic Linux tools to, again, invoke additional tools like profilers or to invoke JDK tools uh, via command line. What's this? I don't need it. And it even sounds risky. So some unused components that increase the, sur the surface of attack. What's worse, if you have even quite fast network, uh, like my local home network, we have to wait for half a minute for this image to be pulled physically to the machine, to be pulled, to be unpacked. That's too long. That's, it's 2022, right? We don't have to wait. And it costs some money, of course. We'll pay for a network. We will waste our time, which may be, I don't know how expensive, but any number will work. We also load our actual physical infrastructure. If it's like not a public cloud, OK, their pain. If it's our pain and we have uh, a big update, well, something may happen. And it's risky and dangerous. Let's try to avoid that by using small images. Well, how small can they be? Tens of times smaller than kind of regular ones. If you compare different operating systems and their uh, base images, you see there's one very special, Alpine Linux. It's like three mega, less than three megabytes over the wire and like five and something then unpacked. And it still has a standard C library. It has a package manager and it has a shell. That's all we need, typically, right? And if we create images based on this Alpine, uh, special Alpine, Alpine Linux, we can get images less than 100 megabytes on disk. So it's like 70 megabytes over the wire, instant deploy. Right, we go. Uh, we can also uh, see that images for other base systems here in this table are also small. That's because of smaller JDK. So JDK can be specially prepared to be effective for such cloud deployments where we do pools of container images. Uh, so it to be small, to not contain some optional components, to be compiled right, to be packed right. So it can be effective, but not as effective as in combination with this small Linux. And voila, four seconds, we get working Java environment from scratch, if you only had Docker. It can be a test container. It can be a local experiment with some Java version, whatever. Or it can be a pull to your production, to a clean pot. Right? We don't have this image. We're pulling it over all the, all the wire, and we spend only four seconds. Or if it happens in public clouds, we spend kind of half of the second or tenth of a second. Right? So small containers help. We greatly reduce our pull time. We reduce uh, our disk usage and headache. Uh, we get rid of some unknown components, right? If it's small, probably we only have things that we need. And it's based on Alpine Linux. So uh, Alpine Linux here is the magic tool, right? It takes care of most of the size spendings. And we have uh, slim images. Alpine Linux is based on Muscle C library implementation and BusyBox tool. 
So if, it, if you look uh, at Muscle C library, uh, we must understand that there are different implementations of standard C library. It's not so popular nowadays to learn C at all, but well, it's the you know, foundation of many things. And OpenJDK still depends on C library implementation because it uses uh, operating system threads, uh, other uh, different syscalls. Yeah, we work with files, file systems. We need uh, operating system for that, and the most convenient way to work with operating system for a program written in C and C++ is to use standard C library. So this particular implementation is optimized for size. It's also written to be simple, portable, and complete uh, in terms of uh, meeting the standard, right? There is a standard for C library implementation, and different libraries try to implement it. So mm, the size uh, of this library is small. There are some nice side effects of uh, keeping the code and data structures uh, simple and small. Like with muscle, uh, you have low overhead uh, than, than threads are created. So you potentially can create more threads than uh, glibc, for example. And then you have different implementations. Again, what do we do? We compare them. So we try to figure out which is the best, if we build an own operating system, or if we try to change the base operating system that we use, we try to understand what's the difference, what are dangerous things, what are good things. So people just made a comparison. Um, muscle developers participated. Different C library implementations, different criteria, many things to compare. There's no single metric to look at. You look at uh, standards compliance, look at performance, you look at memory consumption, many things. Uh, I would say uh, standard compliance is critically important, so completeness, but also nice things like UTF-8 support uh, really help. So you see, in some cases, Muscle is better than glibc. In some cases, it's worse than glibc, but they are comparable. And yeah, if you noticed, I mentioned glibc. This is a typical C library implementation that we meet in wild, right? Like this laptop uh, runs Ubuntu, and it's glibc based. That's so simple. So implementations are different. Muscle looks good especially then we talk about standards. Uh, some performance, additional performance information will come later, but uh, one more uh, important uh, section is support of different uh, CPU architectures, right? We talk about OpenJDK, and OpenJDK runs on different CPU architectures. So it's good to be compatible with libraries that do the same. And containers nowadays, we already run them, not just on x86, right? We also run them on ARM servers. Like you can go to Oracle Cloud or you can go to Amazon Cloud and get an uh, ARM server, very powerful one. So you will need different container images for that. Or you can open your new Mac laptop, right? It's also AR64. So security, performance, compatibility with different CPU architectures, many things. Muscle is good, but it's different from glibc. So some, people's, uh, some people feel scary about migrating to a different C library. Sometimes without no reason. Sometimes there is one big reason. Uh, it is a different DNS resolution. But you just have to know that it works differently. And developers of each library say that the implementation is closer to the standard. But there is no single group here. They just work differently. Yeah, and as I mentioned, hotspot 
is a C++ program, so it uses features from standard C library. Obvious one, probably you know what it is. The second component is BusyBox. BusyBox is a single binary that pretends to be all the Linux tools, all standard POSIX tools, like ls or cat. You invoke a command, but you actually call the same binary. Then you do that. You have the single image in memory, and you share internally all the shared code. So it makes BusyBox very small. It keeps it portable. And uh, yeah, it, it also helps Alpine Linux to be small. Again, uh, if you look at the code, the principles there is to keep the code simple, to follow standards, POSIX standard for all the tools. That makes uh, BusyBox sometimes different from what we used to, other tools implementations, but not that different uh, that could scare you, really. So you just use uh, tools. Sometimes some flag uh, is called differently or is missing, or new additional flags exist, but it's not a problem. And uh, Alpine Linux is not just uh, muscle and busy box. Also, there is an init system. Of course, if you make full installation, there is a kernel. So all necessary components, but only a few of them. As we saw, manager components slightly differ from uh, regular ones. The Alpine Linux itself is not desktop oriented, not typically no GUI in installations. Pretty fine for server usage, right? That makes it even smaller. We don't uh, install it uh, wrong just because we don't install GUI in any case. And it has package manager and a standard package repository. We have different packages. So we can install additional components if you need. We can install native tooling to perform I don't know, native compilations inside the container or whatever. And it is perfect for tiny containers, for micro containers. But as uh, Hotspot is a C program and it depends on C library, there are parts that are implementation specific for every C library. So making Hotspot and OpenJDK actually work and be able to have builds for muscle-based systems like Alpine Linux, it required some work uh, to port the entire virtual machine to that C library. And that work was called Project Portola, initially started by Oracle. And Bellsoft integrated all this work as a job uh, in JDK 16. But uh, it was possible to use Alpine Muscle JDK builds based on Project Portola work uh, even before that. And now it's totally official in JDK 17. And it has been ported to JDK 11. So latest. Uh, the most recent JDK 11 U updates for muscle, uh, lip, muscle C library for Alpine Linux, they are kind of come from the official source. So Project Portal has been integrated. Uh, some interesting issue uh, appeared, and I will cover them uh, shortly. First. Uh, one part, uh, then you create a new port. You have to explain how to build that, right? So there is documentation explaining where to get necessary tools for OpenJDK, uh, how to uh, set up these tools, how to perform uh, the configuration, and actual build to get the OpenJDK binary. And there's a, a useful parts, uh, like cross uh, tooling. So you can build uh, muscle binaries for muscle on a glibc-based system. This means uh, that such tooling 
can help us uh, to port JNI things, right? Sometimes still we use JNI even on server applications, even, I don't know, in some WAR or ER files. We put some native libraries and invoke them using JNI. So we have to recompile uh, that binaries for muscle to use them. Uh, some projects do that. If you, you have an in-house development and your own uh, JNI code, you have to recompile it to use in the smallest containers. So uh, if we produce a generic binary uh, with glibc and standard tooling, we have like some native library, right? For example, it can be a library that prints Hello World for you, if you call it from GNI, Java code. You say, OK, I have a library. Let's load it. And your application loads the library and invokes uh, this Hello World. And yeah, it prints it. Then uh, you can run it in a glibc-based container, which is uh, called Alpine in this example. Well, it actually contains a glibc compatibility layer and a glibc-based JDK. So it also works. But uh, there's a third option. We can invoke a muscle-based container with JDK compiled for muscle. It may occasionally work, but in general, it may break. So what would we do uh, to prevent that? We'll do cross-compilation for that JNI code. So we'll take uh, the cross tool chain and invoke very same command line for compilation, but using cross tool chain compilers. So we are on glibc based system. Our target is muscle based system, and we use cross tool chain. The same happens if we target one CPU compiling on another CPU, right? So we get in much smaller library. That's interesting. And uh, we can run it easily on a muscle-based system or a muscle-based system of the glibc compatibility layer. But uh, if we are trying it to run it on a pure glibc system, things break, right? So in both directions, in general, there is no compatibility. It may occasionally work, but you have to cross-compile or compile muscle on muscle and glibc on glibc. Some other peculiar things besides of DNS. Uh, library resolution. Library path resolution is different uh, on uh, muscle by design. So it's considered to be more secure. It's different from glibc, but there are systems that are also different from glibc, like AIX from IBM. It works uh, also uh, not like uh, typical Linux. Some other things related to security are gone. These are the new uh, Alpine versions, so don't uh, think too much about them. But just if you imagine that you run in older environment, the JDK constructed with this code will still work. And debugging for JVM engineers is Again, uh, it works not uh, as, uh, as they used to see. Alpine is uh, not a graphical user system, but you still can do server-side rendering. It's possible. You have to install additional packages, like Font Manager. No problem. Just it will slightly increase the size of your container. The extremely useful feature in JDK is native memory tracking. It helps us to understand what are requirements and limits for our containers, for our pods. And uh, we just need latest Alpine to have it working in the containers. If you take like latest uh, Alpine images uh, on Docker Hub, or latest Liberica images on Docker Hub, no problem, it's already the latest version, so it works. Also, if you want to run Alpine on Numa, please install libnuma. It's that simple. So some issues for 
Spring developer or whoever who deploys and debugs uh, the deployment on such system. For example, uh, you have to be strict in shell scripts. Don't forget, put the first line. Otherwise, uh, your shell script won't work. So here, an example, we invoke shell script from Java code. And it just says, no, that wasn't successful because the file is not executable to the shell script processor. Another thing uh, is how variables and the dots are treated. So, you know, it's the information, the name is lost. It also happens uh, in other systems, like, for example, in Debian. And we have a Spring solution for that that just allows you to interchange uh, underscores and dots in variable names. So practically, I think everyone already uses the, this solution. If you know, there is a thing in uh, JDK that allows you to debug somehow uh, the processes that are almost dead or effectively dead, so that are still in memory, are not re responsible, but still you can make some diagnostics. And there is a force option uh, for that and the serviceability agent functionality. So it, it was not implemented for this port. This is an optional part. But you know, uh, yeah, it works uh, in JDK, regular JDK 8. But if you take more recent JDKs, it has been deprecated and removed. So you, anyway, don't have this feature in modern JDKs. So just forget it, start to write normal code. Uh, do regular debugging, profiling, and testing, of course, and you won't need it. So the port is upstream, and uh, that's not the only thing that happened, because, uh, you know, people still stay on Java 8 and on Java 11, which is now also a legacy release, right? Some already migrate from 8 to 17, the most recent LTS, because there is no big difference between migrating to 11 and 17. So uh, official port uh, to uh, JDK 11, I think it's already in mainline. So this slide is uh, outdated a bit. Uh, for 8, it won't be in mainline. So use other distributions or different distributions who provide such builds. As I mentioned, x86 is not the only CPU architecture we use, right? Even in public clouds. So AR64 port also works. And also Alpine is not the only system based on uh, muscle. Things like OpenWRT, uh, so firmware for routers, for example, also based on muscle. And we are able to run that JDK builds on such devices. Well, we talked about operating system layer, JDK layer, and it's important to have them both working. So what vendors typically do? They offer both. Like Red Hat does this, Oracle does this, but if you will try to use Oracle Enterprise Linux with Oracle Java, it will be probably costly. <laughs> uh, also, you may think twice, do you need all the standard stuff that's included there for containers, for example? And we've already been used uh, in, into Linux for a long time, and we have a great uh, experience in engineering in our company. So we decided to provide our own OS layer for containers based on Alpine Linux, and it's called Alpaca Linux. Only key four features. So we want to control how Java works on Linux. So sometimes you install good uh, OS uh, layer and JDK as a package, and some things doesn't work. Or you install your JDK, but you're based on a Linux uh, where some components have unknown licenses, and they're not supported by the vendor of your JDK, which is strange. Sometimes you need more performance than Alpine Linux. So uh, we decided to cover the things. 
Div Haven LTS releases for that special Linux designed for small containers to cover licenses, to, uh, to cover long-term support. So, you know, it, it sounds easy. Then you go and create your own Linux implementation, just as with OpenJDK, go and assemble the code. It's public, right? But uh, it's not that easy. Like, for example, we had to create our own installer. That sounds funny, but uh, you need uh, code with exactly right license in all the components. So for CVEs in JDK and in Linux components, there, have to be, uh, there has to be an advisory that uh, describes uh, and helps users to understand what are actual threats. In performance, uh, we can test uh, glibc and muscle against different you know, mandatory components like Nginx, for example, or JDK. And there are real differences that can be mitigated or muscle even can be improved to be better than glibc uh, by using some small tweaks. If we think that we built Linux for JDKs, for Java, for containers, we know which parts to improve. So we know uh, that it's possible to use some, uh, to take advantage of some uh, CPU uh, or some hardware facilities. Uh, we assemble some parts of the library to be optimized for performance. So we trade some size for much better performance. So this solve uh, and make muscle version that's much more performant in some cases. Another example of uh, performance benefits come from using different allocators. So we can have allocator that's involved in your, I don't know, native JNI uh, accessible part of your uh, work or used by things like Nginx or whatever. So uh, for the type of workload that you have, you may select the right allocator implementation, native allocator implementation, that will improve performance greatly. So for allocators, allocators included, and there are different tests that show that. And also, uh, we provide JDK Lite by default. So in containers, you can have better performance with Alpaca and JDK Lite. You can have faster startup time in virtual machines, much less memory consumption. And if you install Alpaca on a virtual machine, you can actually zip it and send an email with just 50 megabytes. We know how to uh, improve your response time, your latency, by using native image and Liberica Lite. So again, then we combine uh, OS and write JDK or native image, we can get good results. So remember, when you choose your way of deployment, first decide do you need native image or not at all. That's important because there are totally different parts. Uh, if no, please realize what do you need from the operating system. Do you need some particular libc implementation? Do you need some particular package manager or not? Well, if you're just trying to make it the most compatible and smallest, choose Alpine Linux or Alpaca if you have additional requirements for licenses, for performance, for support. Again, tell me your stories. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hear them or ask your questions about containers. I love to make talks covering questions from our users or from anyone on conferences. Please try smallest images. See the difference. Choose. Uh, maybe you'll find some bug. I don't know. Please keep your images up to date. And uh, well, it's good to be here. Thank you. Uh, I liked your approach. 
So I'm going to take uh, one photo. <laughs> Please don't go away. Uh, so panoramic mode is the right for this conference. Yay! Thank you.